Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's a case by getting a, a, a degree in physics from Princeton, and then you bet you saw the light and said, I'm here to sign this up. I'm a practicing area where you got the PhD at Princeton in 1993. Since then, he's been doing more on programming languages and infrastructure. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you about some more work he's been doing in the department. Great. Well, it's fun to see so many uh, familiar faces. Uh, I uh, titled my talk a, a low-level approach to uh, programming language infrastructure. I want to sort of suggest to you that the, the uh, language infrastructure I have in mind is really what we want to support research. And uh, I'd uh, like you to be thinking that uh, your research in languages, we hope, is driven by new ideas. Uh, these find their way into languages as features. And then there's a critical point where we want to actually be able to build things and play with them. And so you're building things and playing with them being much more fun than discovering facts about physics. And uh, in order to do that, we have to have uh, implementations. And what we need from our implementations is something that's good enough that programmers will actually use the features that embody the interesting ideas. That's sort of the, the end goal of, uh, of language research. And unfortunately, this often means that we have implementations that require a lot of engineering. Uh, and so the, the path that I'm pushing in my research is try to find ways of building infrastructure that's reusable so that we can do that engineering once and then take advantage of it for exploring lots of different ideas. Uh, now, the word infrastructure is used pretty loosely in the community, but I think the modal definition is really something like this. Uh, where you're, you know, you're thinking about uh, fairly old languages like uh, Fortran or C, uh, putting all of your emphasis on optimization, maybe a little bit of emphasis on architectural exploration. Uh, and that's, that's been the sort of picture of compiler infrastructure for uh, at least 20 years. And I'm happy here if you want to sort of cross out C++ and put in C Sharp or Java there. Uh, but the story is, is primarily from the compiler community, primarily about optimizations. Um, there are other language infrastructures around, a uh, big one done here, of course, the, the uh, Java virtual machine. And these give you a lot more stuff than just uh, an optimizer. Uh, and if you use one of these things, you can expect that there's going to be a particular language model. You think of uh, you know, Java or C Sharp for which this infrastructure works very well. Uh, but the reason that it works well is that there's a lot of stuff built in. And along with the you know, sort of nice reusable stuff uh, built in, there are a lot of assumptions. So you know, with these big infrastructures, it's rather difficult uh, to come in and tweak things and change the assumptions. So these are, these are very nice if the language model that the infrastructure is using is the language model that you want to explore, uh, not so nice otherwise. So when I'm talking about infrastructure, I, I really want to have reuse in mind. So the problem that my students and I are trying to solve uh, is to let you pick the programming language of your choice and the machine of your choice, and we'll do our best to help you get a quality implementation of that language on that machine. Uh, and today, I'm really going to talk just about the language end of things and what we're, uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, to build an infrastructure that can be re reused with many different languages. In thinking about this, uh, I, what has come to the fore for us is the, the other part of this title, which is what's the level of abstraction at which you build your infrastructure, and how does a level of abstraction affect your ability to reuse things? Uh, so I want to sort of talk about this uh, pictorially. Uh, and imagine that you know, up at some high level abstraction, I have C Sharp or Java or you know, whatever the, the new thing is. Uh, and I'm not, uh, in this talk, really going to think at any lower level than assembly code. So I'm going to imagine that the job of my implementation is to get, get down to assembly code, uh, and how am I going uh, to do it? And in my view, things like the common language infrastructure, the Java virtual machine, uh, live here 
at a level that's very close to the source code. And so there's a whole bunch of important things in the language implementation that are below that level. Uh, and so these are things which, uh, if you happen to want to use you know, the garbage collector, the thread model, the type system that's provided by the infrastructure, you're in great shape because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of implementation effort behind it. But if these are the areas in which you want to do your research and you want to exchange, change things, you want to explore alternatives, uh, th then uh, the big infrastructures are not so good. Uh, so we're working on an infrastructure called C minus minus where we're trying to operate at this low level uh, much closer to the machine uh, than to the source code. Uh, and the reason that this is, you know, this is interesting is that there's actually a lot of hard stuff in here that is expensive to build, a lot of effort invested, and therefore worth reusing. Uh, yeah? So, so we have this Phoenix thing, which has very low level. Right. Uh, yeah, Phoenix lives down in, down in here as well. So are you, are you gonna, have you looked at Phoenix and sort of seen what, how it compares to C minus I have not, uh, you know, the, I have looked in Phoenix and seen that it is big. <laughs> so, so that that's uh, um, and you know, we had a summer student this past summer look at Phoenix and didn't really get anywhere. So, um, yeah, I talked with Dave a little bit. I would I would love to be able to make those comparisons a little bit better, but I, I can't do it here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit not just about what level the abstractions are, but kind of you know, when they happen. And an interesting thing has, that has changed since people started trying to build reusable compiler infrastructure uh, is that more and more stuff is, is happening at, at, uh, at uh, runtime. So uh, you know, here are some kind of obvious things that you know, aren't, aren't uh, part of Fortran or C that uh, you, we want to be thinking about for, for uh, future languages. And, Code generators like GCC or VPO, which were built with, uh, with a Fortran and C model in mind, uh, are kind of caught unprepared uh, to deal with these kind of features. And it's not, uh, you know, I don't, it, it's, it's not uh, sort of an accident or a lack of foresight that makes it difficult to, uh, uh, for these infrastructures to deal with, with uh, uh, runtime services. Uh, they don't quite have the right model of what the infrastructure should look like. So this is uh, you know, more or less a replica of the uh, generic infrastructure picture that I showed you, uh, where we're starting with you know, some source code, and you've got a, a front end, a back end, and, and some kind of intermediate form. And so the question is, if, if this is what your world looks like, uh, where are you going to put the things that happen at runtime? So I'm, as an example, I'll, I'll pick the garbage collector say, where are we going to put the garbage collector? Well, the garbage collector can't be just part of the front end uh, because in a garbage collector you have to find roots. Roots are in variables and only the back end knows you know, what machine registers uh, those variables occupy. You might be able to put the garbage collector in the back end if you get a little bit of information from the front end. So for example, that the front end can somehow tell uh, the back end as part of the IR, uh, these are, are the variables uh, that are the roots. Uh, so there are a number of, of uh, infrastructures that have, have done this uh, where the, I'll characterize this as saying that the, the fact that the garbage collector is there is sort of implicit uh, in the IR, it becomes an, a, you know, an additional property of this compile time interface between the, the, uh, uh, the front end and the back end. Uh, and the risk that you take there is that when you make the thing implicit, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to see what are the right semantics and the cost trade-offs. So uh, an example in the garbage collection arena is, are you going to allow objects to move when they're, uh, when they're garbage collected? There's a, some interesting work uh, by Nick Benton and Andrew Kennedy on compiling standard ML to the Java virtual machine. And they ran into trouble because the JVMs of the day were designed uh, you know, not to allow objects to move, to make for easy interoperation with C code. Uh, on the other hand, that slows down the allocator. Uh, and ML was designed to allocate like crazy. 
So Nick and Andrew really had to butt their heads up against this. You know, how are we going to design an ML allocator that tries really hard, uh, sorry, an ML compiler that tries really hard not to allocate heap objects? So that's an example where uh, if you sort of build in the, uh, you know, the garbage collector and you know, sort of hide it behind this interface, uh, you wind up with the wrong cost trade-offs for some clients. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the message here is that you know, every time you build a sort of big piece of infrastructure, you're forced to make certain decisions, and uh, those decisions are going to be good for some clients and not, not for others. So we're trying to figure out how to be a little bit more nimble than that and put together an infrastructure that can be usable for, for more clients. Uh, so uh, the goal here is to say, well, you know, let's distinguish mechanism from policy, uh, find the right set of mechanisms so that different clients, different front ends, can put things together in different ways uh, to get the semantics and cost trade-offs they want, uh, and you know, be sure that we can support the standard implementations uh, without having to, to pick one. Uh, and so the, what we're trying to accomplish is to allow the front end uh, to make the important decisions about semantics and cost trade-offs. And really to pull this off, we need a new view of what infrastructure means. Uh, so this is really the, the one thing to remember about C minus minus if you want to remember only one thing. And that it's an infrastructure with, with two interfaces. So, on the left here, we have the same picture that I showed you before, where you've got your, your source code, your intermediate form, uh, and your generated code. Uh, and this is all the stuff that happens at compile time. But then down here, uh, we have things that, uh, that are happening at run, run time. So there's a runtime system that goes with the front end, might contain the garbage collector, uh, and then an infrastructure runtime uh, that's there to support it. Uh, so the picture is very color coded. These, red boxes involve things that are actually active in a running image. So you, you have a program, you generate some code, and that runs with your runtime system and our runtime system, and all three are cooperating uh, to, get, uh, to get some jobs done. These gray backgrounds are intended to indicate, uh, loosely speaking, modules in the Dave Parnas sense that every module hides a secret. So here, the front end and the front end runtime system are in bed together and they know all of each other's secrets. So for example, they know all about the layout of heap objects. That information is hidden from the back end. Here the back end and the back end runtime system, they know all of each other's secrets. So for example, they know all about the use of machine registers, but that information is, is uh, uh, hidden from the front end. So to achieve this kind of separation of concerns or information hiding, we need not one interface, but two. Uh, and there's a compile time interface that looks very much like your, your typical low-level intermediate code. And then also the runtime interface, which you can think of as sort of exposing just enough of the back-end secrets that the front-end runtime system can do its job. So because this is a new idea, I wanted to sort of give you a, a quick scenario for a problem that I hope will be familiar. Uh, it's the problem of allocating and initializing a new object. Uh, so a popular implementation strategy to do this is to try to inline some of the allocation and, uh, uh, and initialization. So you might generate some C minus minus code to see if you've got enough room for a new, he new object. Uh, if not, call the garbage collector. Once you know you're OK, you're going to advance an allocation pointer, reserve space for the object, initialize fields and do all of that in line. So that's being generated code for, uh, from the uh, front end. Then the garbage collector is going to live in the front end runtime system, do the usual things of scanning roots and reclaiming memory. But in order to scan roots, the garbage collector is going to build on the C minus minus runtime interface. And so that's going to give it the ability, for example, to grab a call stack, look at each activation, and in each activation, find those local variables that have been marked by the front end uh, as roots. And so that's uh, a, you know, a sketch of how the runtime interface generated code uh, all fit together to get things done. Uh, so what we are trying to accomplish is to support multiple languages, each with its own front end, garbage collector, uh, your runtime system, et cetera. Uh, we're hoping that this will be a little bit easier than compiling to a higher level interface like the JVM, the CLR, or C, 
you know, because, for example, you don't have a high-level type system that might be the wrong type system. And we believe that this model can get you code that will be almost as good as what you'd get with a custom code generator. And I want to emphasize that although we've been spending enormous amounts of effort on implementing this system, the real intellectual problems here are problems in interface design. How do we, we separate concerns and introduce an abstraction layer that lets us get good code and also lets us get reuse? So that's the set of problems that, that we're trying to solve. And really, the, the key idea in the solution is that the infrastructure should have two interfaces, the compile time and the runtime. What I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to give you a very sketchy overview of C++, both the compile time and runtime interfaces. And then I'm going to show you two case studies of, so you can see, you know, does this story play out nicely? Is it possible to provide low-level mechanisms that, that uh, are reusable? Uh, and then, because there are so many great people here who know a lot about this stuff, I want to tell you about what I think is our most, most important open problem. And uh, with luck while I'm here, I'll get a chance to talk with you about, uh, some of you about uh, the issues and, and ways we might tackle that problem. Uh, so I'm going to start with this, this overview. Uh, C++ is a language rather than API, which distinguishes it from uh, many other infrastructures. There are a couple of other reasons for this. One is that the community has better tools for specifying what a language means and how to use it correctly. We have a, you know, lots of uh, things for formal semantics. We're not quite so good on the, on the uh, proper use of APIs. Uh, a a uh, language is also easy to use in a sort of purely software engineering sense, uh, not necessarily in, in intellectual sense, but this allows you the freedom to uh, pick any tool chain you want for the front end. You know, all tools can generate uh, ASCII, uh, uh, ASCII programs, and so you're, you're not tied to a particular implementation language in which an API might otherwise be expressed. Um, the picture is not all rosy, however. There, there's a price to be paid, and the primary price is that there are no up calls. You know, when you've emitted a program and handed it off to the C++ compiler, uh, we can't sort of go back and ask the front end questions or ask the front end for resources. So there's some places where the interface is more complicated than we'd like it to be uh, because you know, any information that we might want to have uh, really has to be uh, present right there uh, in the program. So that's the, uh, the overall structure. Something that I personally have worked very hard on is to make sure that a C++ program has a semantics that's completely independent of the target machine. This is not the same as saying that you're going to generate one C++ program and run it everywhere. So one of the ways we, we make this uh, meaningful is that a C++ program has an explicit byte order and explicit word size. And you shouldn't expect to run it efficiently on a machine with different byte order or word size. Um, it's got a very low-level type system, which I'll, I'll uh, sketch for you. And the, you can think of the language as being structured basically in two parts. They're the things that you would find in an assembler to do with uh, your data, uh, imported and exported labels. Uh, and then the code is a bit more like what you would find in a compiler's intermediate uh, form. Uh, so despite the name C++ is not a subset of C, uh, I think the name is really more marketing hype than anything else. So here's the C++ program that you know, runs on more backends than, than any other. We have a, a number of incomplete backends. Uh, there's the explicit byte order. Uh, we have some uh, 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 imports and exports for printf and main. This is initialized data. Uh, labeled with H. Uh, and then here I have a, a, a main procedure called with the foreign C calling convention, takes arguments argc and argv. Uh, it makes a foreign call to printf uh, and then returns. So this is uh, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody's favorite program. Uh, what are you seeing here? Uh, well, the names and the types in this program are resolutely low level. So we have named variables, things like argc and argv. And these have the same semantics as machine registers. So for example, there's no such thing as taking the address uh, of a variable. Other names are first class immutable labels. So you know, h labeling the string, or printf and main. 
Uh, so these, uh, these can't be mutated, but they're used as addresses in an address arithmetic to get access to memory. The type system is uh, at the machine level. We really have only one important type that's a bit vector type. Uh, it is polymorphic in the width, so you can instantiate uh, bit vectors at any width. And we compute ve bit vectors in the language with expressions, and you can store them uh, in these variables that, that have uh, register semantics. And in the type system, there's no, no hint of the meaning of a bit vector, so no distinction between signed and unsigned or float and integer. Instead, as in the hardware or in an assembler, these distinctions are in the operator. So we have both you know, signed comparisons and unsigned comparisons, for example. We do have one other type. It's the Boolean type, and it's used only for control flow. So th this is uh, uh, used in the, the if statement. So there are no object types, no methods, no method dispatch. You know, none of the high-level types that you expect to find in a programming language because we want to leave the client the freedom to pick exactly what's the right type system, uh, how should types be represented. The, there's not a lot to say about the code. Uh, it is divided into expressions and statements. Uh, both of these get you know, they start with either literal values or things that are in registers or memory. Uh, the expression language is nearly pure uh, with, with uh, uh, one exception, there, there's really one effect here which is going wrong. So you can imagine divide by zero uh, as an expression with the, uh, with the effect of uh, going wrong. And that's an error from which you cannot recover uh, in C minus minus. So if you want to, to uh, let the hardware detect this from you, you have to, to live in the, the uh, statement world, uh, the world of control flow. So for uh, statements, we have uh, Dijkstra style multiple assignments. And then we are rich in control flow operations. So we have uh, you know, conditionals. Uh, Go-tos are computed with these first class labels. Uh, we have both call and explicit tail call. Uh, and then we have something I'll talk about, uh, continuation and cut to, which is for control flow between distant, uh, distant procedures. One of the things that we're trying to, to get at, uh, which we're very close to, is that if you have a particular machine instruction in mind, you know what platform you're, you're uh, compiling for, it should be obvious to you what C++ minus minus write uh, to write to get that machine instruction. And so C++ minus minus is you know, expressive as long as we're willing to distinguish computation and control flow. So lots of fancy things uh, we can do, but something like decrement and, or, and skip if zero is something that we can't express because we divide uh, computation from control flow. Uh, so that's what the language looks like. The runtime interface, I'm, I'm just going to sketch. I'll have you uh, some uh, details for you later. The idea behind the runtime interface is pretty simple, that we want to be able to inspect and modify the state of a suspended computation. Uh, so if you want to think of, of uh, computations executing on stacks, uh, we can treat them as an abstract data type. So we can create new stacks, walk stacks. In any activation, we can expect and modify variables. Uh, the front end can leave notes for its runtime system in the source code keyed by the program counter. So we can, can recover those through the runtime interface. Uh, and then we have some ways of unwinding the stack and transferring control to, to uh, older activations further, uh, further down in the stack. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of these things. I want to talk, you know, since I'm talking about interface design, I want to talk about what is and is not hidden. And that is, you know, you how, where's the information hiding? How, what are we going to try to reuse? Uh, so one thing that these interfaces do hide is a number of facts about the machine. So for example, the exact you know, number and kinds of you know, machine registers. You don't need to know if the hardware uses special registers for integer multiply. Uh, you know, exactly which instructions you're going to pick to achieve some computation, that's hidden. Uh, more importantly, uh, what's hidden is you know, 20 years of PLDI and another 20 years of, of optimization research uh, before that. So you know, all of the sort of state-of-the-art register allocation, instruction scheduling, peephole optimization, and pretty much everything that you read about in uh, the, the uh, the uh, Dragon Book in terms of uh, scalar and loop optimizations. And 
We're leaning very heavily here on the work of Jack Davidson, who has really spent 25 years showing that uh, you know, optimizations that at first blush appear to be fairly high level can actually be done very effectively on very low level codes. Uh, so that's really the, um, you know, in, in some sense, you know, what are we trying to reuse in this infrastructure? It's all of this sort of optimization and machine handling stuff that you've, you've read about and it's really expensive to build. Uh, now there's some things that we're not trying to hide uh, in the interfaces and really the, the, the two critical ones are the representation of the high level types, you know, how, how are high level objects or values represented on the target machine uh, and the control flow. And the reason that we're exposing these things is to enable the front end to make decisions about semantics and cost trade-offs. And I'm happy with this uh, design and the design decision uh, primarily because these sort of representation things are really pretty easy to do in the front end. You know, these, are, these are the things that you want to be controlling. You know, how are my objects going to be laid out? Where am I going to have indirections in, in method tables? All of those kinds of questions. Uh, and equally, they are hard to reuse for multiple languages because different people want to decide these, these questions uh, differently. Uh, so that's what C minus minus looks like in five minutes or less. And I now want to sort of you know, examine, you know, can we put together low level mechanisms that, that will enable people to implement exceptions and procedures in the ways that they want to do? Uh -huh. So there's a fairly big implementation space uh, for exceptions. One space is, is uh, continuation passing style, where it, which exemplified by standard ML of New Jersey. Uh, uh, popular one uh, right now is uh, you raise an exception by cutting the stack in constant time. Uh, that's the way Objective Camel works. Uh, a long tradition of uh, unwinding the stack frame by frame in the runtime system. I've used Polytechnic Modula 3 here because that's one that I've had my fingers on so I know the details. Uh, and then there have been some other uh, systems like Self which generated custom code uh, for unwinding the stack. Uh, so C minus minus supports all of these uh, popular strategies, some more popular than, than others, uh, in a single framework. And it does so by you know, providing a set of low-level mechanisms that essentially give you access to two different cost models. And so I want to uh, show you what are the cost models and the mechanisms that support them. So the first model is raising exception in constant time. Uh, and we just want to view this as a general control flow transfer that transfers you not to a label, but to a program point within a particular activation of some procedure. Uh, and at the machine level, this is really simple. It says essentially, you know, I want to change the stack pointer and the program counter, and bam, I'm in a new place. Uh, now, we don't expose the stack pointer and the program counter, uh, but we bundle them up together and provide this language construct called cut to, uh, which has exactly uh, this implementation. This is very quick for things like uh, uh, exceptions or context switching, but as always, there are trade-offs. The big trade-off is that when you're doing this, you cannot restore values of Kali saves registers. I and mean, if you think about how do Kali saves registers work, well, you're kind of you're calling procedures, going down the stack, and a register might be saved at any one of these activations, sort of between you know, where you're going and where the exception is raised. So sort of by definition, you can't visit an arbitrary number of uh, activations in constant time. Uh, so you simply can't get these things back. Uh, this means that you know, not only are these no good if you raise an exception, but they're less useful in the normal case. Because if they're, you know, if they're live on a path that goes through an exception, uh, val those values are live. You can't put them in Kali saves registers. So, one of the things people do is you know, people who like this model, like the objective camel people, will just say, all right, I'm not going to use any Kali saves registers in my compiler. And so that, that uh, mitigates this. Uh, another cost is that you know, this handler actually has to be a dynamic value that contains a stack pointer and program counter you're interested in. Uh, and that means that there's typically a small cost, some few instructions, to capture this value when you enter the scope of a handler. So entering the scope of a handler uh, is not free. So here's the other cost model. This is the, the uh, one frame at a time uh, model. And the, the idea is that I'm going to transfer control during an exception dispatch 
by visiting activations one at a time and visit each frame. Uh, so you can do that through the change activation procedure in our runtime interface. And C minus minus behind the scenes will restore the Kali saves registers uh, as you go. So in a single stack walk, uh, you can you know, restore the Kali saves registers, find the handler, and get to the point to which you wish to transfer uh, control. What's the penalty for all this? The penalty is that raising exception is expensive. But this is what some language designers want. Some language designers have said it is OK to spend 10,000 instructions in the exceptional case in order to save one instruction in the normal case. And you do have some savings in the normal case. Notably, uh, you can enter the scope of the handler, uh, a handler with what's called zero overhead. And really what this means is that you don't execute an instruction to know that you've entered a handler, but rather you have a table indexed by the PC that says, if the PC value is in this range, I'm in the scope of this, this handler. Uh, there's other trade-offs to be made. So for example, uh, if you want to uh, generate more code but have this go a little faster, you can compile in some of the code to do the, the stack unwinding rather than do it interpretively in the runtime system. So those are the sort of the, the big choice of cost model. Uh, what are the mechanisms that make all this possible? Well, the first mechanism I've already talked about, which is the, the runtime uh, interface. Uh, so we can you know, capture the, a, uh, uh, the activation at the point where the exception's being raised, uh, walk the stack, uh, get descriptor is a general uh, uh, routine that allows you to find any kind of front-end data that's indexed by the program counter. So this might be the, the scope of handlers. Uh, you can you reach in and look at local variables. And when you found your handler, uh, you can uh, you make a continuation at that point and change the flow of control uh, to go uh, to that place in the, uh, in the handler. Uh, so the, the, uh, the uh, continuations represent the next mechanism. And this is a mechanism that we use all over C++. Uh, anytime we want to talk about control flow to something other than the same procedure or immediate caller or callee. Uh, so a way to think about the C++ continuation uh, is that it's a generalization of label that includes the activation as well as the, the program point. Uh, it is a first class value, but it is not at all like a scheme continuation because it has a limited lifetime. And so it, uh, it's going to be created on entry to procedure, to create continuations for that activation, and then they die uh, when the activation dies. So here's an example where I've got a procedure. Um, I've got some main code which might transfer to continuation K through stack unwinding or stack cutting. Uh, and then continuation K is going to stand for this point uh, in this activation. Uh, so the trade-off here is that by giving this thing a limited lifetime, uh, we make it dirt cheap. And you know, it caught, you know, depending on how you want to use it, it may cost nothing or a couple of instructions to capture a continuation. So the, uh, the uh, support we provide for control transfer with the continuations. Uh, we have the, the cut to, which I mentioned, in the language. And we also have put cut to uh, in the runtime interface. So you can, can uh, go directly either way. And then the unwinding model is a bit more elaborate. Uh, I've shown you the stack walk. Uh, when you reach the activation you want to be your destination, uh, you actually you build a continuation dynamically. And this is, this is the thing that sits will restore the Kali saves registers and transfer control uh, and then cut to that, uh, uh, that activation. We also provide some language support for stack unwinding uh, through uh, uh, something that has various names in the literature. You might have heard of multi-return point. You might have heard of vectored returns. You might have heard from alternate returns. Uh, if you're familiar with, with uh, the original clue implementation of, of uh, signal sort of frame at a time exceptions. That's probably the closest parallel uh, in a high level language. But it simply says that a call site can have multiple return points and you can pick which one you want to go to. Uh, so the alternate return mechanism uh, is very fast. And there's one privileged uh, case, the, the normal return, uh, which doesn't have any, uh, any dynamic overhead. Uh, 
so how do we know about these, these uh, multiple return points? Well, the, the uh, third piece of mechanism is an annotation language uh, that's used at the call sites. So every call site in every C minus, minus program may have multiple continuations. And so the annotations identify what continuations are available at a call site, and they serve two purposes. One is just to tell the optimizer you know, what's going on, where are the control flow edges, what's happening, so that we can optimize in the presence of these kind of exceptional control flow without uh, breaking the program. Uh, and then some annotations will trigger the construction of tables, which are used by the alternate return mechanism or by this, the, uh, the uh, stack unwinding mechanism to support those things. So here's a completely artificial example showing you every possible continuation uh, from a call site. So here I'm, I'm uh, passing x to g, uh, and I have the normal return continuation, which carries this, this value r. Uh, this annotation also cuts to k1, tells the compiler that it should put a control flow edge from this call site uh, into the program point at k1, and it should note that flow along that edge does not restore the call says registers. So they, they get killed, and anything that's live on k1 at K1 will therefore be guaranteed not to be in a Cauley says register at this site. Uh, the unwinds to uh, produces a similar uh, uh, pair of flow edges, one to K2, one to K3, but these control flow edges preserve the values of Cauley says registers. So it's okay for the compiler to have something live at K2 or K3 in a Cauley says register. The also returns to, as far as the optimizer is concerned, behaves exactly like the unwinding to, uh, but it does a little bit more work in order to build a table for the implementation of the alternate return mechanism. Uh, and then also aborts is a flow edge that, that uh, tells the, the optimizer, uh, we might abort this entire activation while suspended at this call site, so please put in a flow edge from here to the exit node. Now, You'll never write this in a program, because you, you know, there's, there's, I can't imagine a situation where you want all of these mechanisms. Instead, you're going to be deciding sort of what is the right semantics, the right cost trade-offs for your interprocedural control flow, and you'll pick the annotations uh, that go with the, the trade-offs you've chosen. The last piece uh, I'll uh, mention briefly, I mentioned get descriptor before. Uh, for looking up information like what handler am I in the scope of. Uh, this is a general construct that defines a key value pair and can be wrapped around uh, any well-formed region of the, of the uh, program. Uh, and then what the get descriptor does is present a key and, it, and uh, the uh, runtime system knows you know, where computation is suspended at what program point and it finds the smallest enclosing span with that key and returns the associated associated value. So we use this for marking the scope of handlers. We use it for marking routes for garbage collection. We use it for laying down information for source level debugging. It's a general mechanism for the front end and the front end runtime system to share their secrets without telling the back end what they mean. Uh, so this is how we cover the implementation space of exceptions that you're the, you're the big cost trade-off is whether you're going to walk the stack, and when you've made that decision, we provide you with appropriate mechanisms to do what you want, either in the generated code uh, or in the runtime system. So this is an area where I'm reasonably happy with the story about providing low-level mechanisms that, that uh, you know, let you choose the things you want to do. Uh, what I want to do next is look at the procedures uh, in the same light. And if you've been uh, following closely, uh, you should be a little bit grumpy about uh, procedures because they don't really have the properties that I've been arguing for. Procedures are not a machine level abstraction in the way that bit vectors are. And we have, you know, just as with uh, the garbage collector, the problem that we can't really pick you know, one semantics or set of cost trade-offs that's gonna work for all clients. So the, the most obvious example is that you can support standard C calling conventions, or you can support general tail calls. You can't do both in the general case. They're, they're antithetical. Moreover, 
the procedures carry you know, costs for parameter passing and saving and restoring registers that are you know, machine dependent and not obvious to the, to the consumer. Uh, so you know, the you know, procedure is, in general, not a mechanism that has the properties that we would like to have in C minus minus. So why are we there? Well, we're there because Simon Payton Jones and I worked very hard for about a year to take them out, and we just weren't smart enough. Uh, but I think you know, we at least can come up with good reasons why we, we weren't smart enough. What do you have if you have an infrastructure without procedures? Well, you clearly want to be able to compile languages that have things like procedures and methods. And so now what are you asking the front end to do? Well, uh, it has to figure out how machine registers are going to be shared among different you know, methods or objects. That means you have to invent conventions. Oh, by the way, you have to deal with C procedures. Uh, you're going to want to manage stacks of some kind. That, that uh, uh, is, you, know, you have to worry about stack overflow and stack underflow. Uh, so suddenly now, you're, we're not getting a whole lot of reuse here because we're really requiring the, the uh, front end to do a lot of work. Uh, so this is a design decision that I think is OK, uh, in part because uh, it is hard to do. It, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, but also because we've been able to come up with a mechanism that works reasonably well as a target for many different languages, that you, you, even your languages like you know, Prolog or ML or, or uh, you know, C Sharp that might have you know, quite different models of you know, what it means to call something and how you're going to decide where to transfer control. Uh, there are some useful reusable concepts uh, at the low level. But this still leaves us with the issues of semantics and cost trade-offs. Uh, so what we've done here is rather than sort of you know, have piece parts in the language, uh, for the casual user, we just say, here are procedures. Here's a reasonable default calling convention. And we'll give you access to the foreign C calling convention. And then for the users who really want to control semantics and, and cost trade-offs, we give them hooks into the implementation that are you know, there specifically to do that. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how, uh, uh, how we've structured that. Uh, but the, you know, the lesson here for me is that you, you know, if, as a designer, I want to put a high-level abstraction into my infrastructure and I want people to reuse it, I have to work harder. Uh, so the implementation of procedures is messy. There's, there's a, you know, a lot of different you know, details to think about, uh, you know, can use for register conventions, which way the stack grows. <clears throat> Most of these things can be dealt with pretty simply by writing down the answers. And the main issue is that there are a lot of, of uh, uh, answers to write down. The two more interesting and difficult ones, uh, I will talk uh, a little bit about uh, how values are communicated uh, between callers and callees and about how we, uh, how we want to control uh, the layout of the stack frame. Because those are both areas where we have to do a bit more work. Um, so at a high level, the story about parameter passing is, is really easy in that you know, we'd like to pass parameters in registers. You know, that's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the main goal. And we also have to deal with the fact that there are only finitely many registers. And so in some cases, we're going to have to pass things on the, on the stack. Uh, so all we need to do is figure out you know, which registers uh, we're going to pass things in. And uh, we'll be good to go. Now, the C minus minus type system by itself doesn't provide any information that would you know, allow you to decide, for example, whether something should go in an integer register or a floating point register. So, in the uh, 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 in the uh, call and return languages, each parameter and result is annotated with a kind. And to C minus minus, the kind is an uninterpreted string. But you can think of this as capturing just enough information about the high level type uh, so that you can make a good guess about what sort of register you'd like to pass the thing in. Uh, and so you know, three kinds that will suffice for an awful lot of machines are you know, the empty kind, which you can imagine a general purpose register. Uh, the address kind, you can think of a, a 68,000 pointer register. Or the float kind, you can think of a, a floating point register. So 
it's the implementation's job to advertise what kinds are significant on what machines. And then the high-level client uh, has to, uh, uh, has to uh, decide how things are gonna, going to uh, work. And it is pretty easy to take uh, types in something, something like C and say, well, this is going to be a 32-bit value. That's part of the C minus minus type system. And I'm going to pass this with the empty kind, or the char star, 32 bits with address kind. Uh, floating values are going to have float kinds. So this is the, you know, the, you know, the big step that's going to be potentially different for different targets and have to be redone. Once we've got that, uh, we've reduced this to an allocation problem. And we have a you know, very simple you know, sequential allocator where we take the parameters or results one at a time, present the width and kind, get back a location, uh, and get ready to allocate a location for the, uh, the next parameter. Um, what's interesting that we've done is to put together a little language for composing allocators that gives us the ability to do a lot of different strategies as well as to support the standard calling conventions. So I'm not going to show you the language, but rather uh, just a couple of examples. So here's the parameter passing convention for C and the Pentium. Uh, everything gets widened to a multiple of 32 bits, uh, and then they all go onto the stack. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, a particular area on the stack, the overflow block, which can grow arbitrarily large to hold arbitrarily many parameters. So this is something that our compiler reads at startup uh, so that it knows what the foreign C calling convention means. And if you want a different calling convention, you just provide it different code at startup time. You don't have to rebuild the compiler. Um, here's the C return convention, which is a, a little more interesting. Uh, there's a choice stage here uh, that for uh, results of floating point kind uh, are 80 bits wide and get returned on the top of the floating point stack. Uh, and any other result uh, is widened to a multiple of 32 bits and is either returned in register EAX or, or EDX. And there's no overflow block here. So if you try to, to uh, you return multiple results or you run out of registers, uh, the uh, compilation will fail and say that you've, you've uh, uh, you know, gone past the calling convention. The C calling convention does not support the return of multiple results. Uh, What's a dot? Uh, sorry, a, a dot is the is the uh, is uh, a is the module that holds all of the uh, the combinators for the the uh, staged allocation. So so this is just a. Um, yes, the the, the 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 little language for specifying conventions is built into the compiler, and then then. Uh, a module. I mean, I could write my own D, but. Well, so the, the A module is the, uh, um, if you see what's in the A module, it's things like you widen, you use registers. Uh, this is the always true predicate uh, choice. Um, there's no, um, it's just a combinator language. The, 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 there's no actual, you know, the calling convention content lies in how the, the uh, parameters are used. So what this is, doing is registering the, uh, the C calling convention with the x86 backend. Um, does that answer? So, so I think that, that means I can just think of a dot choice and I, a dot y as just the keywords that have Yes, it. you can absolutely think that, just think of them as, as, as keywords. Yeah. Why that's beeping? Ah, it's beeping because my class starts in five minutes. Luckily, someone else is teaching it. Um, so here's a, a picture of a, a more complicated calling convention. This is the, the uh, alpha C calling convention, which uses both uh, floating point and uh, integer registers. But when it drops something in one of these registers, then sort of labels the other one saying, I don't use this. Um, so we specify that uh, uh, convention by counting how many bits of parameters uh, have been allocated. Uh, and then when we get a parameter, we make a choice based on its kind, again, you're floating or not floating. Uh, and then the uh, floating point parameter is allocated into a floating point register in a position determined by this counter. Uh, an integer parameter is allocated in an integer register in a position determined by this counter. And then when we run out of registers, uh, both of these things wind up on the stack uh, in the overflow block. So I'll give you a little flavor of, of how this, this works. Um, we have specified standard C calling conventions for nine different machines. 
Uh, and they're, you know, they're mostly pretty small. The, the Pentium and Alpha examples are, are uh, perhaps slightly more complicated than, than average. You know, the, the simplest things are things like the backs. Um, most complicated is the MIPS, which has some very unusual conventions for the use of registers. Uh, the implementation is very simple. The, this, uh, we have this you know, little language that has these sort of simple allocators like uh, sequence of registers as base cases, uh, some combinators. Uh, we've given it a, a precise semantics. And the implementation uh, in ML is, is uh, very small. And then the student who worked with me on this uh, took the same semantics and implemented it in C++ uh, to try it out in a different compiler, the Machine Sweep compiler. And it's a you know, bit bigger here, but still quite manageable if you want to, to put this in, uh, into a compiler. The other thing that I, I'm just going to sketch uh, is the stack frame layout. Uh, you'll often see in calling specifications uh, these kinds of pictures. And we have a little declarative language uh, which essentially allows us to name each of the blocks or pointers uh, in a picture like this and say, uh, this is the way that, uh, that the blocks uh, should be laid out. What we're achieving by this is just to decouple the stack frame layout from the phase ordering in the compiler. Uh, so each of these uh, you know, little uh, regions has a symbolic address. Uh, we allocate to, uh, in those regions. And then when we're all done allocating, uh, we lay out the stack, uh, the stack frame. Uh, you know, either you know, we have things that, that are live at the sh same time that, that uh, are concatenated, or for example, if we have uh, things associated with different call sites that aren't live at the same time, we can overlap them. Uh, we wind up with a, 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 a bunch of constraints. We have a very simple linear equation solver, essentially stolen from Knuth's solver for Metafont. Uh, and uh, uh, all these symbolic uh, addresses uh, just become indirections from the stack pointer. Uh, so that's you know, you know, another problem that we've been able to solve, perhaps not as nicely as expression. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, I want to tell you about uh, what I think is the, the most important uh, problem we have left. And that is, uh, what do we need to do to support concurrent languages uh, in a reusable infrastructure? So there are a lot of interesting problems here, uh, probably you know, more than, than we can handle by ourselves. Uh, the things that we're most aware of as being important are what's the memory model? Uh, how do we want to deal with synchronization? Or do we want to have some form of, of uh, you know, transactions or lock-free uh, interactions between threads? But the one that I've highlighted uh, is the management of the stack for a concurrent language. And you know, the, the, as you probably have guessed, you know, the C minus minus runtime interface is very, very heavy uh, on dealing with the, uh, dealing with the stack. Uh, and the implementation of the stack affects the, the things that you can do. Uh, so the, you know, the reality that we live with is that you know, the operating system will give us sort of at most one apparently infinite uh, uh, stack. Uh, if we want to have more than one threads, it's up to the language uh, to manage finite stacks. Um, so you need to know how many threads you're going to have. If you're going to have just a handful, uh, you can allocate big stacks. If you want a lot, uh, your stacks had better be small. Um, are you going to detect stack overflow? I'm always amazed that this is a question. But there are you know, you know, people located in certain areas of New Jersey who uh, just want to allocate big stacks and hope that they don't overflow. And, uh, are you only a move? Uh, a, a whole stack or a stack frame, do you require that the stack be contiguous? Or are you willing to split it into pieces? Uh, what if you want to go beyond just your threads? You want to think about you know, scheme continuations and you're know, copying stacks. You, you want to copy stacks lazily. Uh, so there are a host of different ways to answer these questions. And I, I attempted to get answers from A to Z. And so I have uh, at least uh, ALF to uh, Shea scheme there. Um, we're focusing on the stack because you know, in C minus there's a lot of stuff we can we expose, but the stack is ours. It's an abstract data type, and so it's up to us uh, to do it right. Uh, what we have at, at present is completely unsafe, and that will just you know, allow you to create a stack and run on it and hope that it uh, that doesn't overflow. 
Uh, so I've been working with a, a, student, uh, a student this spring uh, on uh, detection of stack overflow. And the idea is that you know, when we create a stack, we'll uh, have some opaque value that the back end uh, knows to look at to find out if the stack is exhausted. Uh, we'll put a, uh, a uh, limit check uh, into, the run, into the compile time interface, the C minus minus language, uh, and then start to think about uh, movement and, and uh, other things at runtime. And I'll say a bit, uh, a bit more about this. Uh, so the limit check is like some of the garbage collection things and that not, you, the knowledge you need is divided uh, among the front end and the back end. So only the front end knows where to find the stack limit. Just for example, it's a policy decision whether you want to burn a register to hold the stack limit, uh, limit cookie. Uh, only the front end knows what to do if you run out of stack. Uh, on the other hand, only the back end knows how big any particular frame is. Only the back end knows you know, how much headroom do you need to save state and recover uh, if you run out of stack. So there, there, uh, uh, you know, there has to be you know, something in the interface to enable this kind of cooperation. Um, the way we're doing the limit check is that we allow the front end to put limit checks anywhere in the, the uh, procedure that they like. Uh, and the limit check cuts the flow graph into confined and unconfined regions. So uh, front end can put any code it likes in either region, but the confined region is going to be confined to a bounded amount of stack space, uh, some amount of headroom that's chosen at compile time uh, and is shared across compilation units. Whereas the unconfined region can use arbitrary, uh, as much stack space as it likes because the limit check will have guaranteed that that stack is available. So, uh, the analysis is very simple. When you enter the pre procedure, you're in a confined region, and then the unconfined regions are exactly those areas of the code that are dominated by a successful limit check. And so that, you know, this way we, you know, we don't you know, put any prescriptions on you know, where the limit check has to be or exactly uh, you know, what you're allowed to. Th so the, there's one restriction was that you're not allowed to make a call in the confined region because that can uh, consume unbounded stack space. Um, so I don't think I'm going to uh, talk about the, uh, the uh, recovery. Um, so where we're, we are in sort of problems that we, we think we know how to solve, um, it's easy to do a limit check in every procedure. Uh, it's you know, easy to implement you know, various popular policies for, for holding the stack limit. Um, what we don't know how to do is something like what you'd find in the Capriccio uh, thread system, where they have a, a whole program analysis uh, that uh, chooses exactly where to put the limit checks and, uh, uh, and you know, so that you amortize the cost of a limit check over multiple calls. And you know, our model, we, we don't know how to share the right information that only the back end has to make that kind of whole program analysis possible in the front end. Uh, so we're now sort of getting into things that you know, you know, we're uh, less and less uh, certain about. What do we do when the stack does overflow? Well, we have a way to identify the uh, stack that, that failed. And the sort of uh, you know, two simple strategies are to move the whole stack to someplace bigger uh, or to uh, just perhaps move the failing frame uh, or a couple of frames and create a new, uh, uh, a new stack segment. Uh, if we're going to segment the stacks, then we have to worry about you know, what happens when we uh, you know, cross that segment boundary uh, going the other way. Now we've introduced stack underflow. Uh, we have to think about you know, how much hysteresis so that there, you know, there aren't a lot of underflows and overflows uh, in inner loops. Uh, so it's very unclear how we're going to proceed with this. Uh, we're leaning a little bit on some work that Kent Dibvig did with, with the Shea scheme and a couple of nice PLDI papers. So we're trying to figure out how do we adopt those techniques and use them in the C minus minus setting. Um, so now I get from things that we sort of have some ideas here. This is now the complete pie in the sky slide. And so this is, this is what I'd like to do, and I have no idea how to do it. I was thinking about you know, what kind of abstraction would we like to present uh, to clients to deal with the stack? Well, the call stack as linked list is actually a pretty nice model. You can, you know, what th kinds of things can you do with a linked list? Well, you, know, you can move a record anywhere you like and update the links. Uh, it's easy to insert things into a, a linked list, uh, delete things from a linked list. Uh, you can you know, copy things in a linked list. You can have you know, two different linked lists that, you know, that share tails. Uh, 
how can we do this and still have the sort of efficient uh, call and return uh, that, we're, that we're used to most of the time? Uh, how can we do this and you know, support locality so that you know, f you know, frames that are adjacent in the abstraction uh, are also adjacent in memory? Uh, so those are the problems. The reason that I'm excited about trying to do this is that if, if we can manage this, we can do a lot more than just, just threads. So we can have uh, you know, stacklets, which is a sort of very lightweight approach to segmented stacks. Uh, you think about incremental stack scanning for improving pause times and garbage collection. You can imagine, well, I've got a stack. I'm going to scan the three youngest frames. And I'm going to stop scanning there and insert something that says, well, if I return here, uh, let me scan another few frames, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, if you uh, have this kind of stuff, you can easily implement first-class scheme continuations. You can copy an entire stack, copy parts lazily, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, I've, I've got a first-year grad student signed up to work on this. I, I think this is, uh, you'll be very exciting to take some of these really gnarly implementation techniques uh, and find a nice way to package them up, and I hope we can do it. Uh, so you know, our thinking on concurrency is that you, we acknowledge the memory model and synchronization as interesting and important problems, uh, but we really feel like our, our challenges with the, the stack, uh, particularly overflow and underflow, uh, and at the, as far as the compile time interface, I think the, the limit check is a necessary step and, and one that will, will do a lot for us. Uh, and then there's this very fuzzy goal of saying, well, can we make the stack look like a linked list? Uh, so that's uh, everything that I uh, wanted to tell you about. Uh, I want to sort of leave you with uh, you know, what I think are the, the high points of the, the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, the C minus is a kind of compiler infrastructure with a little bit of a different focus, uh, not just thinking about optimization, but really trying hard to support multiple programming languages uh, as well as multiple machines. Uh, when the goal is multiple languages, uh, it's hard to work with high-level abstractions, because when you pick a high-level abstraction, uh, it often comes with semantics and cost trade-offs that are not going to be right uh, for every client. So we're trying to work around that by having primarily low-level interfaces, mechanisms that your know, different front ends can combine in different ways uh, to get the abstractions that they want. Uh, and really, the, the key idea that makes it possible for us to do this is a two-interface idea, that, that both the compile time and the runtime interface. Um, so we've spent quite a bit of time exploring this strategy. Uh, and for exceptions, it works pretty well. Uh, I haven't talked about garbage collection, but it also works uh, very well in that setting. Uh, it didn't really work for procedures. So we had to resort to different techniques uh, for exposing the, uh, the procedure semantics and the cost trade-offs uh, in the implementation. Uh, and then, as I said, I think the most important problem we have left is you know, what kind of uh, infrastructure should we provide uh, for concurrent languages? Uh, so I've had a, a lot of help with uh, all of this, uh, many students and colleagues. I was thinking that like, almost half of the people on this list are current or former Microsoft employees, and you are very lucky to have them. I've been, uh, been privileged to work with them, and you can you know, sort of go to our website and you know, play with the system, uh, I'd, I'd be uh, delighted to get your feedback. So could you talk a bit about the experience of people using this for languages? You mentioned there it says ready for early adopters. So, so it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's really been a mixed, uh, uh, in, in a mixed bag. We've, the, the high order bit of the experience is that people seem quite keen to play with their compilers and add a C minus minus back end, and it seems to be a pretty easy thing to do. And then they get to the runtime system and they want no part of it. Uh, so the, the, um, you know, the, the high order bit is that uh, we seem to understand fairly well the kinds of assumptions compiler writers have made and have produced an interface that's congenial to them. Uh, but the runtime, the, the runtime stuff is another story. So that's been the story with Milton. That's been the story with GHC. Um, uh, John Ruppy keeps talking about uh, uh, using uh, uh, you know, Moby, but he's, he also keeps wanting the, the OS X backend, which has not yet emerged from the graduate student's office. Um, 
Craig Chambers has probably pushed things the farthest, and he's got a C minus minus back end for Whirlwind. And I don't, you know, you know, he, he was playing around with this stuff uh, maybe eight months ago, and his, he's had some undergrads uh, doing some things. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, the, the, so the, the, the um, you know, the, the one thing we really learned is that you know, if you already have a big runtime system, it's going to be a lot harder than we thought to port it to C minus minus. That's uh, uh, sort of scratching our heads and figuring out what to uh, what. To, and the, you know, the other thing that we've learned is that your your people already have compilers. They really want you to give them a lot before they'll try your stuff. So we've, we've had um, we had also some odd things that I you know, from people I don't know and so it's, it's hard to evaluate what they're doing. So there's a guy at Johns Hopkins who's starting to use C minus minus as a back end for a new language he's doing from scratch that I don't understand. And he has, I've just had this barrage of questions about various design decisions. Um, there are some people in Kansas who are trying to use C minus minus as a front end for a hardware synthesis language. Again, I don't quite understand what yeah, you know, this is not what we intended, so I, I don't I don't understand what leverage they're uh, they're seeing there. So, so, so I'm curious. So you mentioned one obstacle, which is just there's so many large runtime systems, it's difficult to port to C minus minus. But is there something? I mean, that's sort of a sociological thing, which is that anybody's got a large artifact is going to be reluctant to, to modify it unless there's some substantial way for them. Um, do you think that there? I mean, are are we still sort of struggling with the right abstractions, or is it the implementation efficiency of you can provide these abstractions, but they're not as efficient as you know? I'm no, I think we're still struggling with the right abstract. So, so the other, you know, the the uh, um, you know, the people in our community who who you know, want to do things that really scale and the can. So there, you know, you know, there's I've, you've heard, probably heard from four or five people that says, "I'm eager to try it once you solve the threads problem." Uh, and that that's a case where we really don't know what the right abstractions are. Um, there, you know, there's some other things we've you, we've learned in, in the noise. So, for example, in the um, in the C minus minus interface says that the front end runtime system can ask about any variable in the source code. So we did some experiments with Milton with the Craig's front end. I had a student do these this summer. It turns out that. Uh, on average, at, at the average call site, 97% of variables are dead. And this is because you know, people use variables like temporary registers, and they know they're not going to ask about them at runtime. So there, uh, you know, there are some things that we're, you, know, you we probably will put into the interface, the idea of an unnumbered variable that you can't ask about. Uh, you know, there are some other things where uh, people think there are some efficiency gains to be had. It's like, well, I just care about these group of variables, and I don't want to refer to them individually. I just want to be able to iterate over the group. And the, the obvious thing there is the, uh, you know, the roots for the garbage collector. And you know, there's some nice, you know, you know, papers in the literature that says, well, if you just know these things are in a group, uh, you can make sure that when they're spilled to the stack, they're in adjacent locations. There are other games you can play. These are kind of in the noise, I think, in terms of your little, you know, your know, little performance uh, you know, things. The real, um, you, you, the real open question is, how does this correspond to the existing structure of the compiler? And you know, so there've been a, there've been a couple of classes and students who've just you know, built toy compilers from scratch on top of this, and they're very happy. But you know, that wasn't the only audience we were aiming for. Um, Simon and I have worked on GHC. Uh, went through one convulsion about two or three years ago, and we're starting a second one. You know, we were doing these big refactorings of GHC's back end to make it fit better with C minus minus. And Simon is ecstatically happy because he sees big improvements, what he perceives to be big improvements in his the structure of his compiler at each iteration. But I'm a little discouraged because I see how far we have to go. And, and you know, when I look at the structure there, you know, they've got a runtime system that's almost 40,000 lines of C code. Uh, and when I look at the structure of that and trying to figure out how to make that play nicely with these abstractions where um, you know, those abstractions were not designed into the runtime system. Um, you know, so I don't, you know, I don't know if this is ever going to be useful for legacy systems. Just don't know. It's 
possible, but it's definitely going you know, to um, it's definitely going to be more work than I expected. Thanks for the assessment. It's useful to yeah, I think they're really interesting questions in runtime systems. And you're right, if you, you think about that, you know, that picture that I had, your know, security model, threads, garbage collector, type system, all these things that are above the level of C minus minus. Well, you'd really like to get some reuse in that domain as well. I think there are a lot of interesting, interesting things to think about there. You mentioned you have these two interfaces, essentially, the, the code and the, the runtime system. You mentioned an ASCII interface, the whole thing. Uh, it's, certainly, that would be for the uh, for the program part, the left side of that, it. Right, that's right. What about the right side? That's, it's a C API. It's a, it's, it's a C API. So you know, our, our hope is that um, you know, if your runtime, your runtime system might well be written in C or something that can call. But you know, it's, it is a risk. So I was you know, talking with uh, with uh, uh, Jan Vitek, who used the, the uh, MMTK, this sort of nice garbage collection toolkit that Steve Blackburn and others worked on. It's written in Java, and I'd love to hook that up to C minus minus, but it's just not clear to me that it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be possible. So I yeah I don't uh, yeah I don't know how that's going to how that's going to play out. Yeah if. I mean, if we were living in the Windows world, it would make it a com object, and that would that would be a you know, a better story. But we didn't you know, we didn't want to live just in the Windows world.